Live from Cambridge, Massachusetts, extracting the signal from the noise, it's The Cube, covering the MIT Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Symposium. Now your hosts, Dave Vellante and Paul Gillen. Welcome back to Cambridge, Massachusetts, everybody. This is Dave Vellante with Paul Gillen, and we're here at MIT IQ, the MIT Information Quality Conference, which is really focused on the Chief Data Officer. We're here at the Tang Center. Dr. James Meng is here, a CUBE alum. It's great to see you again, Dr. Dr. Meng. James is a, a retired, just this year, retired deputy officer. This month. This month, congratulations. congratulations. <laughs> Fantastic. And so we have all the, very fresh in your mind, all, yeah, the, yeah. all the great stuff, so we're going to talk about that. Office of Assistant Secretary of the Navy, uh, really your focus has been your career on data quality and transparency and, and really uh, initiating the edicts of Congress uh, for the federal government. Well, thank you very much for joining us again. Oh, pleasure is mine. Yeah, yeah so, yeah. wow, retired uh, after a, 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 a long and excellent career. How's it feel? Oh, wonderful. And so I can devote more time to this kind of academic uh, exchange and uh, bring about, uh, you know, greater knowledge and advancement and using the real uh, life experience so that uh, one day we can find a more optimum way of uh, improving uh, government's uh, data quality eventually. So what do you make of, uh, this conference obviously has been focused on data quality historically and then of course the chief data officer role has emerged, the big data theme has emerged. How, what is, as a practitioner in, in this industry, how do you respond to the changes that have occurred and where do you see it going now that you can step back after your career and, and sort of look to the future where is where have we come from and where are we headed? Right, okay, uh, actually uh, if we step back uh, to about uh, 1990 uh, vintage, uh, that the Congress established a uh, government uh, performance um, uh, and the results act, uh, it's called a GPRA. Uh, 1993, it demands the government uh, be more transparent in terms of their financial primarily in the financial management aspect. And then came 2010, actually came out in 2011, and it's called the GPRA Modernization Act. And that's uh, President Obama's, um, uh, one of his signature uh, uh, legacy is to improve the uh, data transparency using the modern means. Instead of uh, hiding the stovepipe data warehouses somewhere, now the data becomes uh, accessible by the, um, uh, the general um, population. And the more recently is the Digital Data and Accountability Act uh, in 2015, which uh, really get into the nitty gritty. Uh, it's uh, really focused on the standard format of you presenting the data. So, the government uh, is also learning in the process that just talking about the data transparency without understanding the data standard, which is a fundamental root cause driver for what we call the data divergence. You cannot uh, integrate and uh, now focus on the standard. And so my role in this uh, uh, symposium, uh, this is the fourth year, and I've been here and made in uh, presentation every year, but for the past two years, uh, I've been focusing, bringing about the government agencies, primarily federal government uh, agencies, uh, advancement and then initiatives in uh, fulfilling you know, GPRA and the Data Act, and what are we doing? And why are we doing what we are doing? And what are the key lessons learned in this uh, process. So you go from accountability, transparency, to standardization. Some people might think that's putting the cart before the horse, but maybe the thinking was expose it so we can understand what the what the problems are yeah. uh, and, and, then, uh, and then create standards. Is that right? Or, or was this really putting the cart before the horse? Well, uh, actually it is. Yeah. The, the data standard is something we really have to do from the very beginning. But uh, of course, the computer era and the data processing and all that started long ago. 
as a result, all federal agencies uh, accumulated many, many data systems and many, many applications. Number one, they are not interoperable. And then number two, there are no standards or architectures to bring that interoperability. And as a result, that uh, past data initiatives uh, suffered a lot of uh, uh, setbacks and the difficulties and the resistance, and largely because we did not uh, uh, really have a commonly accepted data standard and the data architecture that we could leverage from. Realizing that now and going back and really doing that, uh, it's actually a very major advancement because without doing that, you will never get there. Uh, yeah. It occurs to me that, that, that you have been tackling for the past 25 years a problem that many CDOs are facing right now, which is in, uh, interoperability standards, consistency of, of, of data formats. Uh, what lessons can you share from your experience as they embark on this this task? What lessons can they learn from, from what the government is doing? Well, that, uh, that's wonderful. That I will actually present that one o'clock, but might as well share it right now. The, uh, there are two uh, key lessons that we learned. Uh, first of all, is the um, uh, data standard um, is not something that you, um, uh, there is no shortcut. If you wanted to have a data standard, you really have to initiate that from the offset and you have to be very determined to get it. And data standard uh, uh, it's not a, a technology, it's not a strategy, uh, and uh, it's uh, a more about uh, management change of people. Uh, people resist that because uh, you're digging me in my backyard. Uh, you demand to know more about, you know, it's, it's really my business. You, I don't want you to do the uh, micromanagement. Loss of control, right. loss of authority. Uh, yes, exactly, for those fears, uh, you really have to have a way overcoming that. And to overcome that, number one is you cannot come down as a mandate. You know, I'm descending from the highest, uh, you know, uh, echelon and uh, thou must do this. Uh, first of all, data standard, you're not going to get it in one year. You're not even going to get it in five years. It's a very long, hard journey. Actually, we learned that from IBM. IBM started doing that uh, 25 years ago, and they were kind to share their lessons and learn from it. It's a very long journey. So it's a journey, it's not a step. And that's the first uh, lesson to learn. It's a, uh, uh, the data standard is not given. You really have to work, and there's nobody can help you. Your own organization is unique for whatever business, product and services that you deliver. You have to do that, mm -hmm. nobody knows better than yourself, and number one. Number two, is this is a really, talking about the interoperability, it's a really a system of assistance engineering issue. We're dealing with a lot of inter-operating systems. They all are independent. They reside differently, they are managed differently, they are governed differently, but yet the data they create has to be interoperable. So all of a sudden, the different stovepipes of assistance that have been created over the past 60 years or longer have a new requirement that those systems have to be interoperable. Not in their day-to-day -day inter, inter, you know, uh, operation, but in terms of the data they produced needs to be interoperable, and that is a new requirement. So most of the large organizations all of a sudden found out that the system has to be interoperable and that was not originally in their requirement document. Well, well can, can you describe what you mean by interoperable? I mean, there's standard, standardization is one thing, but interoperable, what, what, what uh, does that uh, mean? Interoperable fundamentally demand two things. One is that you have to be able to be accessible by systems that you never thought about that they need to access your data. Mm. Number one, number two, is when they access the data, it needs to get through the interfaces that has interface standard. 
So all of a sudden, you have to have a data standard, but you also have to have interface standards. Those were the things we learned through, I mean, I work for the Navy, we learn from all our warfare systems are governed by the interoperability many, many years ago. So we realized that system engineering discipline has to be brought in in order to allow the data become inter, you know, operable and accessible and being able to still retain its pedigree that during this data transfer, it's um, a standard and the polished, the clean data is not being lost in that translation. So this is a, obviously a very difficult problem in, in a large part because of the pace of, of data growth. So you're creating data at an exponential rate uh, on these systems that are non-standard. <laughs> so you're essentially refueling the plane while you're in the air. So how do you, and you've got people, you talk about accessibility, well that's not just giving them access, it's, it's who's got the right to access that data. Uh, you've got the process around which you standardize that data. Um, and then you've got the, the technology that enables all this. So how do you deal with the fact that so much more data is being created in let's say a five year period than you've created in the entire history of the organization? How do you deal with that? Okay, I'm uh, more optimistic uh, than you are, Dave. That uh, <laughs> <laughs> number one is that uh, the key ingredients in order to succeed in this uh, process, number one is the common understanding of the urgency of the need to do the standardization. And the number two is that there are so many enabler came into being because the past decades emphasized on, you know, bring this together, standardization, interoperable, and the integrated data from sources you never thought about before. So there are very, very, very good enablers that helps the leadership in terms of standardizing the term, uh, taxonomy, and also in terms of bringing together the interoperability from a variety of uh, systems. To name a, th uh, a few, like uh, open architecture. So this is a technology enabling? Yes, yeah, okay. there are technology enab enabling us to do. IBM has done it, uh, and uh, we have done it uh, in other applications. Mm -hmm. So this is not a mission impossible. Uh, true, the data is growing at the enormous rate, but that rate does not dictate the ability for us to make the system interoperable. And in fact, the internet commerce is growing so fast, yet you are able to get onto the line and access any places you want. What does that mean? It has a internet protocol that it was dictated to begin with. Unless you follow those protocols, you can get in. Okay. So, so it is possible to get okay, that. Okay, so yeah. it sounds like the approach, I'm going to simplify it, is to say, okay, all the data we create from this day forward will have this standard. Uh, and, and that's step, step one. <laughs> no. uh, and then, do you go back and standardize the existing corpus of data, or do you just let that die through attrition? Well, for, for the approaches we are doing, um, uh, as far as I know, we are from this point on. Yeah, okay. Uh, so you're are, not trying to go back and no, no, solve the problem that, of history. Bec because you will never see the uh, light of the day. Okay. okay. It's a mission impossible. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and also <laughs> there is an issue about what is the value. Uh, we don't just uh, do things without business value. There are times we have to go back, but when we do need to go back, there are data, uh, legacy data processors that we can generate, we can use but not on a global scale. And uh, what we are really driving is uh, from here on, we leverage all the modern technology so that we can uh, uh, leverage 
uh, the benefit out of it rather than uh, looking at the rear. How, how rear. do you future-proof this process? I mean, we don't know what new kinds of data we'll be using in the future. Internet of Things is coming online, introducing a whole new set of protocols and, and data types. How do you future-proof this process? Um, right now, uh, in, in a way, the, the government agency, the majority of a government agency are dealing with largely structured data. You know, accounting, that's a digit number. Uh, you, 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 know, you, for the federal government at least, uh, we have many, many years of work to do just on the structured data. Uh, of course, on the unstructured data, you know, the like uh, IBM brief yesterday, uh, data analytics, uh, they have uh, IBM Watson. Uh, if you have uh, seen Watson, IBM Watson, you know, demonstration, you really, it's impressive. <laughs> you know? They did very so, well in Jeopardy. Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, well, that's why they beat the Jeopardy, um, but I mean, beat the human team. But the, uh, um, the unstructured data, the IBM Watson, represents the future, right. one of the future approaches. But of course, uh, there is always a, a probability of, and they, they will also tell you, you know, what is the probability this uh, projection is uh, correct. And, um, you know, the extrapolation, uh, uh, plausibility of the data uh, has some uh, limit too. So if, uh, our uh, focus right now are primarily on the structured data and there's enough, enough work there for, to keep us busy for decades to come. So in terms of the, how do we make sure that we are doing, are indeed has a sustainability, my view is that until we meet the GPRA and GPRA modernization and data act, uh, we really have uh, many years of work uh, to do, and that's our sustainability. And there's uh, the that's uh, it's uh, the mandate we have to fulfill first. James, in the commercial world, uh, there's a lot of discussion around. You know, you've got centralized IT, and you've got the lines of business. And with all this data explosion and the opportunity to drive revenue, the lines of business heads, the P and L managers, go out and they initiate. They spend money on. We call it shadow IT, right? Uh, and they generate projects, and some of them are very successful, some of them fail, and the, the failed ones, they go back to IT to clean up, the successful ones probably do too at some point. Is there an analog in the Navy where you have this notion of shadow IT, uh, or is everybody sort of you know, <laughs> adhere to the edict of we will standardize? Do you have that problem of seepage where initiatives are started and not, they don't necessarily comply to the edicts. Well, actually, we encourage innovation and the flexibility. When we say data standard and interoperability, we are primarily dealing with the major operations, which represent 90%, right. say, for our Navy operations. Uh, but that remaining 10% is dispersed around all our major commands and especially for research development and acquisitions, they are actually given that flexibility so they, they, because they are dealing with the innovation and changes on a daily basis. And it will be really you know, overbearing to go down and say, thou must follow this uh, standard. There is no business value to do that. The, actually, in the standardization, the two key things that we have to uh, be very, very uh, careful is uh, allow the flexibility so that each command and the business areas, and they can create their own without being dictated by this uh, overarching uh, architecture and the standard. And also encourage the innovation so that your assistance can be collected or uh, be accessed by many, many research institutes and uh, academia uh, without going through this uh, very rigorous um, you know, uh, data quality um, uh, rigor. But aren't those two objectives completely counterpoised, the flexibility and the standardization? They are on the opposite ends of the spectrum. 
But on the other hand, that's why we have executives. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's your high paying job. That's why we pay <laughs> the big bucks. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's a challenge. And uh, of course, uh, there are a lot of uh, subjectivity in terms of where do you draw the line or you don't draw the line. But uh, in general, we do understand uh, where we have to uh, enforce and where we also have to encourage uh, innovation. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, most of us, uh, especially at the executive level, we go through a lot of uh, executive uh, training. Mm -hmm. And those uh, issues are brought from and say, be careful. I mean, don't drive uh, the organization into the mud. And, you, know, you know, just uh, following the GPRA to the end of the life. And because uh, there are uh, issues uh, that 20 years, uh, 30 years from now, you have to deal with. And all that innovation has to start today. Mm -hmm. You know, don't kill them. What What are you doing to to share your your findings and your methodologies with uh, with business or with uh, um, the commercial sector? Obviously, there's a great deal that you've learned here. Yes, uh, at least in the Navy, we, and I know for all our agencies, uh, we share our uh, actually not only share but largely draw the lessons learned from industry. For example. Uh, within the Navy, we have a data standardization working group. Uh, we've been doing that every week uh, for uh, 150 times. In those uh, working group uh, weekly telephone uh, conferences, uh, we routinely invite industry like um, uh, Abinicio, Informatica, IBM, um, you know, um, um, and many uh, uh, companies, uh, large and small, on a uh, focused issue. They are selfishly very open and share with us their most uh, recently learned uh, le uh, you know, lessons. And we learn from those who we jump, uh, rather than uh, try to catch up from behind. And, and uh, you, know, um, you know, for example, the data standardization not to mandate but in a collaborator uh, uh, mood, and they uh, inform them and say, we really want to pay this back. Okay, you help us, you tell us what are the data elements, or what do you use, what's the data dictionary, and we will do the maximum to incorporate becomes the overall data standard, and uh, we may have to tell you, you have to drop some, because you have to adopt somebody else's in order to eliminate the overlap, but in return, we will give you those business intelligence dashboards, we do it for you. You get that back. And it's a, it's, it, you have to give them the benefit back, otherwise they say, you know, get lost, I'm busy. Yeah. I got my mission delivery, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't learn, I don't understand what is business intelligence and all that, but so that's a mutual, you have to make a mutual. So, so we're out of time, but last question is, so how are you doing? How do you measure you know, your progress and how's it going? Well, uh, later on this afternoon, you're going to um, be able to see, in addition to the uh, defense uh, uh, part of the agencies, uh, now we also bring FCC, uh, Office of Management of uh, Budget, uh, and also the uh, Department of Energy, so I hope uh, next year we will bring more federal agencies to, and their uh, initiative is just uh, mind boggling. Uh, it's incredible, the approaches that they are taking and they're very much on the front tier, on the cutting edge of adopting those uh, industry approaches and solving the problem and meeting all the government mandates. So uh, my view is uh, the, the collaboration at this uh, forum and all the team members uh, who came and are really very, very uh, happy that uh, this are the kind, uh, this is the kind of forum that we exchange the uh, lessons learned and uh, accelerate our initiatives. To me, it's uh, extremely mutually beneficial. So I'm very optimistic. So I hope to see you again, get invited <laughs> back next year. Yeah, absolutely, but you're Dr. Retiring. <laughs> you're, 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 you are optimistic. Uh, you're, you're very relaxed attacking such challenging <laughs> problems. <laughs> so congratulations on your retirement and on, on an outstanding career and 
Thank you very much for coming back. And the next year, I'm going to be co-chair for this. So, uh, you know, my, my new uh, endeavor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, okay. oh, you signed up to be co-chair. All right. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> You're going to be very busy. Maybe busier yeah. than you've ever been in your life. <laughs> working okay. hand in hand with Rich. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah. Thank All you right. very much. Thanks again. All right. Okay. Keep right there, everybody. Thank Paul you. Gillen and I yeah. will be back with our next guest. Yeah. Right after this, this is SiliconANGLE's The Cube. We're live from MIT. Be right back. <laughs>